Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, fantastic to see that quite a lot of people are joining today. Um, I think that this is not new content for most of you, as a lot of you joined um, the HRP webinar last year um, and also the webinar before the year before that as well. Um, but thank you um, to everyone for, for joining. Um, so this webinar um, today is on the 2023 HRP process. My name is Bryony Stevens and I serve as the coordination help desk and temporarily supporting as the partnerships, programs and advocacy um, team lead until Anna is back in office later this year. Um, I also have the pleasure of introducing to everyone our new Deputy Nutrition Cluster Coordinator of the Operational Field Support Team and RRT, Russia Al Adi. Uh, Russia, it is um, an absolute pleasure to have you on board. Um, and welcome to the team and over to you for the opening remarks. Thank you, Russia. Thank you, Bryony. I hope uh, you are hearing me well, colleagues. You hear me? We can hear you, Russia. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Bryony, for the introduction. It is uh, my absolute pleasure to be uh, with you guys uh, and join uh, this great, uh, great team um, in Geneva and for sure with you guys in the field. Um, thank you, Bryony, for the introduction. Um, if, uh, if you allow me, I would like to take you for a quick uh, briefing for the purpose of this webinar and what exactly we will be uh, discussing and also few important points that should be highlighted as well. So as you know, uh, the purpose of this webinar is to, you know, to disseminate the latest update and guidelines for 2023 humanitarian program cycle processes and um, the Global Nutrition Cluster ongoing support to the uh, country coordination team during this process. Um, so it is a very similar process to 2021, 2022. So no need to <laughs> be more like uh, worried about more tasks to be done. Uh, but also, um, you know, um, as you are already starting working on at the field level of your HNO and HRB. So this process, we feel that it will help you while uh, you are already starting your annual planning processes. Few points just to be taking in consideration that we would like really to uh, highlight the importance of familiarizing ourselves with the new core commitment for the children, uh, as it really articulates very well the coordination rule that uh, UNICEF is leading as a cluster lead agency, especially on CCC1 on the leadership and coordination part. Um, it is very also important that um, the coordination team to work very closely with the program team at the country level, especially, uh, you know, the methodology for the bin calculation, the development of the HRB to ensure that we are all on the same page and that the HRB and HAC actually are aligned. Um, so this is why we need to work uh, with them uh, even more, as also that was highlighted in the clear to evaluation and its uh, subsequent uh, recommendations. Um, you know that globally uh, undernutrition um, rates are increasing high and the burden of malnutrition is also uh, increasing. So this is why it is very important now than ever to ensure that we are working on both the humanitarian and development, uh, you know, uh, fronts to ensure that we are addressing all forms of malnutrition. I really would like to thank the coordination colleagues, the team, um, the OPS team, and it's always, um, you know, the team is available for you to provide any needed support. Um, if we move to the overview of the sessions, so uh, you will find that today we will have the session in English, it will be followed by another session in French, but for the component of the session itself, um, you will have the overview of 2023 uh, humanitarian program cycle and HRV processes. Bryony will take the lead in uh, provision uh, of the session and also the development of 2023 humanitarian response plan. 
and then it will be followed by the key considerations, especially for the intersectoral linkages, um, gender-based violence, uh, and also the gender, the disability, accountability for affected population and others. And then we will also explain very briefly the available support that will be provided to you guys. So please um, enjoy the session and please feel free to share any concern or any question you may have. Um, and we are here for you. Over to you, Bryony. Uh, thank you for that, Russia. And again, um, a warm welcome to the, um, the team. It's wonderful to have you on board. Um, OK, so like earlier years, um, the first part of today's webinar will focus on the overview of the 2023 HPC process, specifically pertaining to the HRP phase of the HPC process, um, and also to share guidance developed by OCHA to support with this process. So this image will look familiar to most of you on this call. This is the humanitarian program cycle. For those of you new to the HPC, the humanitarian program cycle, um, or otherwise known as the HPC, is a coordinated series of actions undertaken to prepare for, manage and de deliver humanitarian response uh, using a common performance and monitoring framework, which helps to ensure better accountability. The overall purpose of the HPC is to deliver a fast, coordinated, effective and protection driven response to people affected by humanitarian crises. One of the main outputs of the HPC is the HRP. Uh, this is developed during the strategic planning stage of the HPC and used throughout the HPC to support with resource mobilization, implementation and monitoring and also review. Regarding updates to the 2023 HPC, only limited modifications have been made to the HPC process uh, for 2023. So this is very similar to last year. So anyone that participated in this process last year, um, you can expect no major changes. So as discussed in the recent h &O webinar series, which was led by Antenne, the HRPs build on the h &O, which provides the evidence base and analysis of the magnitude of the crises uh, and identifies the most pressing humanitarian needs. These needs inform the strategic objectives in the HRP, as well as the specific objectives and the cluster plans um, that follow from these strategic objectives. While the HRPs are primarily recognised as management tools, they also act as a resource mobilisation tool. In terms of the structuring of the HRP, so similar to the HPC process in its entirety, there are no major um, or significant changes in the HRP temp template compared to last year or the year before. So for those that have already participated in this process, it should look somewhat familiar. The document consists of an executive summary and five parts. While the cluster and sector plans are listed under part three, it's important to highlight that the other sections are intersectoral and the inputs of the nutrition cluster or sector, I will be using the two terms interchangeably um, within, with, uh, within this webinar, um, but I do refer to either the cluster or the sector. Um, so the cluster or sector are required to ensure that nutrition is adequately addressed in the intersectoral parts of the document. So how to do this exactly will be discussed by GNC colleagues during this webinar. Here you will see three key guidance documents for the development of the HRP. Um, so these have been published by OCHA in the second quarter of this year um, and all available on the OCHA website, but also available on the GNC website and um, for those that are UNICEF staff on SharePoint as well. So the first document is the step by step guide for the entire HPC, including the h &O and HRP process. And I think that most of you will be familiar with this guidance, as it was also presented in the h &O webinar by Antenne a few weeks ago. The second document is the HRP guidance and template, which indicates what information to present and how to present it. This guidance includes a useful mock example of what an HRP should look like. And that was actually the screenshot in the slide just before this one. And the third document is the HRP response analysis and prioritize, prioritization document. 
document. So the documents um, are all available online um, and this link here will also take you to um, the documents as well, the link that's presented on the slide here. So this next slide, um, so this is the full list of guidance that has been published to support with the HNO and HRP process, including the step-by-step -step guidance and the HRP instruction, um, instructions, which we just discussed. You will note that OCHA also promotes the use of the GMC developed nutrition needs analysis guidance for nutrition clusters, as illustrated on the right hand side of the slide here. So this slide highlights the 10 steps of the HPC process, and this is sourced from the step by step guide. Um, as you can see, they are the same 10 steps as last year, so nothing has changed here. Um, and this webinar will focus specifically um, on the four steps on the right hand side. So steps one to four um, is more so on the HNO process, um, but as you know, this will underpin the HRP process, um, which is from steps five to eight of um, the HPC. So in terms of step five, um, so this is the de defining the scope of the HRP and to formulate the initial objectives and includes the initial scoping of the HRP based on the results of the HNO, um, as well as the drafting of the preliminary intersectoral strategic and specific objectives. Step six, conduct response analysis, consists of a review of possible responses, options, and estimation of the target population number. Step seven, um, the finalization of strategic and specific objectives and indicators. So this includes the finalization of the strategic and specific objectives, uh, the identification of indicators to monitor the response, and the development of the cluster response plans. Lastly, step eight includes the drafting of the HRP and the costing. While this presentation won't actually touch on steps nine or ten, just to flag, uh, the UNICEF Cluster Coordination Unit, also known as the GCCU, has drafted guidance specific to step ten, and this should be finalised and published for the next HPC, but will likely not be ready for, for this year. Um, once this is available, we will be sharing that uh, on behalf of the GCCU. So I'm just going to attempt to launch a quick poll. Um, so for those of you that joined this webinar last year, this will be um, the same poll or a very similar poll that you completed last year. Um, so this is just to identify um, which stage of the HPC that you are at. This is also really helpful for us as well because it lets us know um, which country um, is still in the HNO phase or the HRP phase um, and also how we can direct our support as well. So I'm just going to give it a go. Okay, so everyone should have received um, a poll on their screen, so it should be overlapping with your um, with the PowerPoint. Um, and great if you can just uh, complete that. Thank you. I'll just give everyone just one or two minutes to do so. Thank you. see that there are still some more people responding. We have eight, 12 responses. Um, so I'll just give it a few more moments. Okay, so I see that we're plateauing at 14 responses. Uh, so thank you everybody for responding. Um, 15 responses. 
I assume that also there are some people that um, this is not applicable to. Um, so I'll present the, the results as is. So interestingly, so I think this also corresponds with um, the time frame, which is um, available online, um, the global time frame, the um, HPC, uh, which indicates that most people are in the HNO phase. So we can see here that most people are in the step two, uh, which is the secondary data review completed, and also step three, the primary data completed. So as we know, steps one to four um, is the HNO process. And then I see that the majority of respondents um, actually don't know. So that's about 31%. Um, but um, that is fine if it's if you are unsure, it may be your role within the coordination team, um, or it might even be that um, OCHA is yet to have these discussions at the country level. Um, so this is great to know because it also highlights that this HRP webinar is very timely, as most of you are still in the HNO process, um, so you're receiving this information prior to the actual start of your um, HRP process. So thanks everyone for responding to um, that poll. Okay, so moving on. So the next series of slides is specific to the 2023 um, humanitarian response plans, the HRPs. Um, so this pertains to both the intersectoral chapters as well as the nutrition um, cluster or sector response plan as well. So this slide summarizes the role of the nutrition cluster in the development of the intersectoral and sectoral specific chapters of the HRP and specific actions that cluster teams need to take at a cluster level and at an intersectoral or intercluster level for each step of the HRP process. I just want to highlight that this slide actually does differ in content to last year, specifically to the intercluster or intersectoral action. Um, and many thanks to our focal point on um, intersectoral collaboration um, just for updating this. Um, and we do highlight that to everybody um, for your consideration um, as well. Um, so while this the HRP process is led by OCHA at a country and global level, clusters have a key role in providing input towards each step of the process, which in turn is informed by discussions with respective partners. As we know, appropriate nutrition for all is fundamental in reducing morbidity and mortality and also for increasing well-being. It is essential that nutrition is not only addressed in the respective sectoral or cluster response plans, but also in the uh, intersectoral chapters of the HRP as well. This, this is to ensure that the nutrition cluster potentially influences the, strate the strategic and specific objectives of the overall HRP. For example, reducing GAM could feature as a specific objective in the overarching HRP. Um, further, there could be many potential complementarities and synergies between the nutrition cluster and other clusters, which uh, the nutrition cluster has a role in identifying. As listed in this slide, there are specific actions that um, uh, a nutrition cluster um, is to undertake, undertake to ensure that nutrition is adequately um, addressed. So for example, for step five, defining the scope of the HRP and formulation of initial objectives, cluster partners can be consulted on cluster priorities and potential interventions underpinned by the HNO. Cluster coordination teams are recommended to jointly develop a list of prioritization criteria, a prioritization matrix or heat maps, and develop a short list of potential interventions. The nutrition cluster um, coordinator can then share the cluster, um, uh, share with the cluster these um, uh, during the intersectoral discussions to identify the complementarities and synergies across the other sectors and clusters. Um, so for step six, conducting a response analysis, the nutrition cluster coordinator can consult nutrition cluster members on the appropriateness relevance and feasibility of the proposed interventions and then raise these discussions at an intersectoral level to identify intersectoral response synergies. Just to clarify, when we speak of appropriateness, relevance and feasibility, 
Um, so appropriate, appropriateness refers to interventions that will most likely meet the humanitarian needs, for example, um, so for OTP, for severe wasting without complications, um, relevance refers to the priority needs and preferences of the affected populations. Um, and for, um, for example, the mobile IYCF clinics and um, as well. And feasibility yeah. refers to operational factors such as physical access to blank blanket supplementary feeding program distribution points um, during the rainy season. So for step seven, this specifically refers to the development of the cluster response plans uh, and the finalization of the strategic, intersectoral and sectoral specific objectives. Again, it is important for the nutrition cluster coordinator to participate in the intersectoral discussions on this step to ensure that response efforts are integrated. So for example, WASH and nutrition um, in health care centres, um, we need to ensure that they are sequenced, for example, OTP for a severely wasted child, followed by agricultural assistance, um, or also layered. So, for example, nutrition, food and agricultural interventions target the same geographical areas. The last step, step eight, refers to the costing, and we will touch on this a little further um, on in the presentation. But on this step, um, I just want to highlight um, here the importance of addressing intersectorality in the costing phase of the HRP. Um, for example, if and when developing project sheets, we need to ensure that they are intersectoral. For the vetting process, we can also bring on cluster coordinators from other clusters, which can also share um, their views on the project sheets through a different lens. So once the strategic and specific objectives have been formulated for the overarching HRP and the nutrition cluster has finalized its prioritization and targeting within the response analysis, we are ready to start the developing the nutrition cluster response plan under section three. The cluster or sector plans um, can either be developed with the strategic advisory group or the SAG, um, and endorsed by partners or um, developed directly with the, the partners. So there are two different ways to do so. But with that, there are advantages and disadvantages to each approach. For example, when developed with the SAG, it can be more straightforward and quicker. However, um, although partners are asked to endorse the plan, there may be less buy-in. When developed directly with partners, the process can be quite time consuming. And as a nutrition cluster coordinator, we might, might find that our time um, is spent negotiating and building consensus. To address this, partners can be uh, asked to focus on different sections of the plan and the nutrition cluster coordinator can bring everything together. So this slide illustrates the main components of the, the cluster or sector response plan. As you can see, the cluster response plan outline is very similar to last year. While not new information, I will share a few key points that may support with the development of your respective sectoral response plans. So regarding the objectives, we will just need to ensure that the objectives are based on the sectoral and intersectoral needs analyses and linked with the specific and strategic objectives. Objectives are to consider cross-cutting um, themes such as gender, GBV and disability. Um, and also for UNAIDS fast track countries, we are also to consider HIV as well. It is also important to highlight that the objectives highlight, um, highlight key intersectoral collaborations with other sectors. With this in mind, when developing our cluster response plan, plans. It is essential that we reach out to other sectors to ensure that they adequately address nutrition in their respective objectives. Further, when considering response modalities, including service delivery, in-kind, cash and voucher modalities, these must be considered in a complementary um, multi-sectoral way, not just through a nutrition lens. While we recognize that the word limit is tight, the wording of the response modalities must link with the various activities with the other sectors and highlight the inter intersectoral nature of our work. For the paragraph on monitoring, here you need to include key information on your monitoring plans, taking into consideration AAP 
and the SPHERE standards. You can also share information on routine and ad hoc monitoring and include a, des a description of various assessments and partner surveys. For guidance on the selection of indicators, you can refer to Table 1 of the Nutrition Needs Assessment Guidance, which lists the core nutrition indicators and the repository of indicators available in the Nutrition Humanitarian Needs Analysis Tool. Also in the Nutrition Needs Analysis Tool, you will find that a monitoring tab has been added to better support you with this process. Also, like last year, the 2023 HRP will have a strong focus on um, the humanitarian development nexus, and this must be addressed in your respective um, sectoral or cluster plans. For this, we highly recommend that coordination teams engage with country level some um, colleagues were present to identify possible entry points that may not already have been considered, considered, particularly around recovery, transition and localised strategies. So as most of you are likely aware, the second part of the sector or cluster response plan lists the cluster objectives, indicators and figures. Again, there are no changes to this section for the 2023 HRP process. Um, it follows the same structuring and layout as last year. Here, clusters or sectors are required to estimate the number of people targeted for each specific nutrition service. Uh, so to complete this process, cluster partners will have to agree on the coverage that each type of nutrition service will have. These targets will not only be reflected in the cluster response plan, but contribute towards the overall number of people targeted, which we presented in the intersectoral sections of the HRP. We won't go into detail on targeting here, but if you would like more information on targeting, uh, you can listen to the 2023 HNO recording, which is available on the GNC website, uh, and also the e-learning modules on this topic, which are available on GNC Learn. So once the nutrition cluster has detailed its priority activities and interventions in a nutrition cluster response plan, it can develop a budget for its collective nutrition response. This is the last step of the HRP process and corresponds with step eight of the HBC process. The nutrition cluster coordination team um, should lead in the development of this budget, um, which can then support collective resource mobilization efforts. To develop a budget for a collective nutrition response, there are three steps that need to be taken. So step one um, includes a mapping of existing resources. Um, step two um, is the budgeting for the collective nutrition response. Um, so this could be either using the unit or project based costing or a mix of both. So in terms of the costing, this is usually um, decided um, by the humanitarian country team um, and will be shared um, with the, the clusters and sectors. So clusters and sectors will need to follow this decision. And then uh, the third step is presenting the nutrition response budget within the HRP. You may recall from last year's webinar that we shared that OCHA was developing guidance on this topic. The good news is that the first phase of this consultancy is now complete. However, the recommendations shared need to be approved at an IASC level before OCHA can start on the second phase of the consultancy. Um, the second phase of the consultancy um, includes the development of the guidance. We hope that this will be ready for the 2024 HPC process. So while this falls outside of the scope of today's webinar on the HRP process, um, we thought it might be useful to touch on the linkages between the HRP and the subsequent um, nutrition cluster work plan. So once the nutrition cluster response plan has been developed, it needs to be translated into a nutrition cluster work plan. Um, so this should include details of cluster activities, outputs, timeframes and responsibilities. The work plan will support annual planning and guide activities which support the effective implementation of the nutrition cluster response and contribute to the increased effectiveness and coverage of programming. Results of a cluster coordination performance monitoring, so the CCPM exercise, can also help to inform the work plan. 
If you would like examples of a nutrition cluster work plan, you can find examples from Somalia and Yemen on um, GNC Learn and also the GNC website. Again, slightly falling outside the scope of this web webinar, uh, but we do want to use this opportunity um, to highlight CC1 um, as this specifically um, affects um, the budgeting of the nutrition cluster um, or the nutrition response plan. Um, so as shared last year, the GNC and the GCCU have worked together to develop guidance on minimum cluster staffing. So this guidance can be used internally to advocate for adequate funding to support with coordination staffing. And you can find that guidance on the GNC website. In terms of available guidance to support with the HRP process, in addition to what was shared um, um, under the OCHA website, the GNC has again updated the nutrition cluster specific guidance to reflect the 2023 HRP process. So this includes the 2023 um, HRP quality assurance checklist, the GNC HRP tips document, and also the nutrition cluster coordination checklist. Um, so we will share all of this guidance um, in the follow-up email to this webinar. And of course, this guidance can be found online as well. Lastly, we want to reshare information on the GNC e-learning modules. We now have over 140 e-learning modules, and there are two modules specific to the development of your HRPs. So here you can see a list of the e-learning modules that are available to support specifically with the HRP. Um, we've also included a few links that can support with the HNO process as well, just um, for reference. Um, so for each um, of the slides that we have presented and the steps that we have discussed, we have a supporting e-learning module. Uh, if not a, an entire module, there will be part of a module which can address the, the steps. Um, so we have also included here a few um, um, GF modules um, as well. These fall, again, outside of the scope of today's webinar, um, but shared due to their importance and relevance to the HRP development. So all of these modules can be found on Agora or GNC Learn. And just to highlight here um, that it's not just for UNICEF staff, these e-learning modules are available to everyone, so partners as well. So please feel most welcome to share these links. So I recognize um, that you won't have the links directly with you, but um, if you go onto the um, GNC Learn, you can simply um, use the find function to um, search for these modules. So I will now hand over to Rachel, our Intersectoral Collaboration Help Desk, who will present our next section of the webinar on the cross-cutting themes and um, intersectoral collaboration. So over to you, Rachel, and thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bryony. And hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. So yeah, so as Bryony mentioned, I will present the next part, which is on uh, cross-cutting uh, issues. And uh, just important, uh, as important as uh, the first part presented by Bryony, those cross-cutting issues needs to be integrated throughout the humanitarian project cycle, meaning HNO and HRP. So it's very important that they are integrated through the intersectoral and the sectoral specific chapters. So that's why we thought we will uh, dedicate quite some time to, to, to go through those theme with you today. So maybe next slide, Bryony. So we okay, so two of the main cross-cutting thematics that we need to consider during this HRP development include GBV, gender-based violence, and also disability. So on this first slide, what we see is what we want to see basically in the HRP, meaning at least one cluster objective, pin and target calculations, knowing that for global estimate in a population, if you don't have any survey done, we estimate 15% plus percentage of the total population with disability. And then what's very important is to disaggregate by age, sex, and disability. Then there is a to, to better monitor. It's very important to, to again disaggregate by age, sex, and disability for better follow-up. 
and we'll uh, show example of, uh, of indicators. Then we have the priority actions listed here when that comes down to nutrition interventions. So again, here it's highlighted that's very important to integrate targeted action groups with intersecting form of vulnerabilities. So here you have some example, for instance, address specific nutrition requirements for adolescent girls with disabilities among pregnant adolescents. And then it's important to undertake essential or minimum action on GBV risk mitigation and disability inclusion. So one tool available is this audit. I don't know if, I mean, again, huh, if you, you haven't seen uh, this audit form, that's something we, we can share with you. You can do it at the uh, nutrition service uh, facility level, probably in the, also at the community level. And what is very important, what has been highlighted by our colleagues working on, on those two thematic, it's really to in, interact with local women organization rights or people with disability to, to understand better and, and really collect context, contextual information to better answer to, to their specific needs. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you, Brani. So here you see a list of examples <clears throat> of how disability can be addressed in your respective response plan. So disability can be integrated in the response options in monitoring and should be considered in costing and resource mobilization. So people with disabilities, as I said before, needs to be involved in program design and delivery. <coughs> What's important, so maybe we can go through some. So again, it's a bit of a repetition to what I've previously said, but it's very important to reach out to local organizations of persons with disabilities and to engage with them during the assessment and response planning to make sure we get good feedback and complaints mechanism and we understand what's going on and what the needs are in a specific community and context. Response planning, so some, some example of activities, making sure we can measure to the improvement of accessibility of the facilities because that can be, sometimes it's really just little thing to, to change, to think about, but uh, can be very hard to some people with certain disability to access our facilities. So that's the first thing to, to think about. Then adapting our screening, screening tools, because it's easy to say, make sure you measure and get the nutritional status, but for some disability, we might need special formulas or maybe adapt special tools. And that's, we have, st we have like examples and use in uh, other organizations. So that's something also we, we can share with you. Outreach to groups excluded. Sometimes people are a bit of shame and they think or cannot access. So it's very important to, to understand who is left behind in the community and make sure we facilitate the access or we go, with our outreach team to, to make sure we can uh, access the, these people, et cetera, et cetera. And then monitoring, as I mentioned, so disaggregate relevant indicator, very important to disaggregate by sex, age, and disability. What good is uh, recently the, the team has developed a tip sheet also. So I will share with you the link and uh, you, you can have a lot of much more examples and key thing to think about when you want to to integrate well uh, disability within your your program so this tip sheet has been developed like two weeks ago so we'll make sure you we share it with you so that you you can have it when uh, you develop your hrp next slide please so here we are on gender-based violence risk mitigation a bit the same approach than uh, the disability one the team has developed a matrix to help you to, to match after like you have done your assessment. What the team have noticed, specialists have noticed is like we often have a good understanding of, of the needs and the problematic in the field, but what's missing is like what to do, what, what can we offer, what can we do better? So that's why they developed a, a matrix and uh, hopefully that will help you to, to, to associate needs and responses to according to to your context so that we will make sure we we share it with you and also on the gbv front it has been a gbv pocket guide also developed so that one is much more developed than the tip sheet of course and it's a resource package 
that you 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 can use, of course. So it includes it's really practical because it includes like decision trees, the do's, the don'ts, so to make sure we we don't do any harm. And yeah, how to to support specifically like children and adolescents under 18 years. So again, this GBV pocket guide, we will uh, share it with you when we share uh, all the documents that uh, Bryony already uh, highlighted. And there is also a complete HPC toolkit that has been developed also for, for GBV. And that one really takes you through all the phases of the HPC, so meaning the needs assessment, the strategic planning, how to implement, monitor and evaluate, and also that includes some uh, training material. So we we'll encourage you to, to go through those guides. I mean, again, if you are in a rush, we will recommend the GBV pocket guide and this uh, matrix to, to help you think and, and propose answers to, to the needs that you, you, you have observed in the field. Next slide, please. So here we change topic. We go to another cross-cutting theme, which is AAP. <clears throat> so when it's possible, again, the, the cluster, the sector should make use of civil society to test and validate assumptions made in the response plan. Feel like again, it's a bit like uh, GBV and uh, disability. We have to understand what's going on, and the best person is the community. They know exactly what their needs are, what works, what doesn't work for them. And instead of trying repeating the same thing over and over, better to to take time to go down to the field and have those discussions. They are the, the key relevant person who may be able to, and they will be able to represent their interests directly. So you, you will save time at the end of the day and the answer will be much more appropriated. So it's very important in addition to the response plan to identify then key activities and then to make sure that those activities include like, again, like setting up to make sure that all the activities we put in place have a certain mechanism, feedback and complaint mechanism in place that we collect the feeling of this community. Okay. So like the GBV and uh, disability, there is a, also a tip sheet that you, you can see an extract here that has been developed by our colleagues. So again, it's to help you to specifically look at how do we monitor AAP performance in clusters? The, we will, we can be, well, sorry, we can use also the CCPM as a framework. So this tool could be useful when developing HRP, but it provides again example. We invite you also to, to look at this tip sheet when you develop your HRP and you touch base on AAP specifically and we'll share that with you also. Next slide. So here we change again. We are on cash and voucher assistance, CVA. So what's interesting with CVA, you can touch on prevention and also on treatment of malnutrition. So here are some examples basically on how to consider CVAs when you do either prevention or treatment of malnutrition. So here you have like some example for how to combine basically household assistance with uh, individual feeding assistance. How can we consider cash and voucher, voucher sorry, in those both components? So do we supplement, for instance, if there is a food distribution going on? Do we top up with cash or voucher to make sure that the family can uh, can afford specific food, nutritious food for, for the young children, for instance, if it's not part of the of the package of the food distribution. We can also combine like cash and voucher voucher with SBC intervention. It's a bit like and any any I would say any um, intervention activities that you do directly within the community. Basically, it's opportunity. And it's opportunity like when you do cash and voucher, you have people coming, gathering. Why not? Like you can do cooking demonstration, you can do SBC interventions, you can sensitize them on any other key nutrition uh, messages that you think are important within this community. So using opportunity and provide conditional cash transfer to incentivize 
attendance to priority preventive health services. So it can be a bit the, the attraction that we have to be careful and to not like disturb the whole services and uh, all what partners are doing when we when we encourage that approach. But if it's to promote vaccination, I mean, again, we have to look at the context and make sure that we don't do more harm. So that's for prevention, ideas on prevention. And then for, for treatment, so on that one, to be honest, I will be even more careful, but again, you have to look at the context and sometimes we do like promote cash or voucher on the top of uh, the, the treatment for severe acute malnutrition can be for paying the transport or again buying special food for older children or younger children or the rest of the family is that something you, you have to define again according to the context but making sure we don't create more malnutrition because sometimes that's something that can happen and another example it's a uh, household cash or voucher assistance to caregivers so yeah we can specifically like give them voucher to buy like food for the family to make sure the treatment of acute malnutrition is protected. But that's something to look at the context and making sure yeah, that all the conditions are there and we don't make any more harm to, to the family. Uh, practical tips. So important to clarify whether the CVA will be used to deliver plan programs. It's important, of course, to include when you develop your HRP to include evidence on why you want to use CVA and that you can use CVA. It's kind of obvious to make sure the market function. Well, it's always, always very important to check that, check the food available and maybe like financial barriers that can that family can uh, can uh, can face to to access the nutritious food, making sure that there is safe and water and hygiene items. Sorry, transportation to reach health and nutrition services. So, yeah, you have to think broadly and make sure that before distributing vouchers or or cash that uh, people can make use of them and uh, state the percentage of the response delivered by using CVA. Yeah, it's always good to, to of course, to see, you know, among all the, the activities that you have been delivering, like how, what is the percentage of activities like delivered by using CVA. And for the, for the program, like nutrition program, more specifically, it's good to, to keep like outcome indicator, but for our own sector, I mean, we don't have to change everything on CVA. It's important to inform the, sec the CVA, like how much they contribute to deliver our, our, our sector, but we don't have to change all our indicators into, into CVA specifically. Um, so our colleague also shared some link. Brian, we'll have to remove those links here because they don't work, but I got new links and uh, I'll make sure uh, everyone gets the new link. So it's basically, to get access to the evidence and guidance note. I'm sure most of you have seen it because it's not a new one. It was done probably two years ago now, but it's still very valid and very relevant. And again, that can uh, help you think through and see what could make sense or not in your respective country. And then there is a specific guidance brief that has been developed recently. So it's and good thing it's available in English, French, Spanish, Arabic. So that's quite good. So uh, I'll make sure those new links are shared with you so that you can uh, you can access them. Next slide, please. OK, so the next slide is on uh, intersectoral collaboration. So maybe just before like diving in a bit more, I mean, what's important is because we have been spoken of like intersectoriality with OCHA, which it's true, they coordinate uh, the, the big uh, intersectoral collaboration process. But when here and within the cluster, when we speak of intersectoral collaboration, it's much more in depth, if I can say like this, and it's taken specifically with different clusters, which often are food security, health, wash and nutrition. Sometimes we do collaborate also with protection and education. 
So the idea to, to work together is to improve outcomes for, for the affected population. And we work much more in depth to make sure that our interve intervention are converging at the same time and the same place for the same people in needs. OK, so that requires quite some work together before deciding where we are going to intervene. But uh, so I'm going through the steps after. But that's important for you to separate a bit the two, not that it's completely different, but during ISC, there is much more depth and work that we have to achieve together. OK. Um, so for just to, to give a bit more, so it will be like identifying the target population. So you have already with your H, within your HNO process identifying like pin number and the targets that you want to identify, meaning globally. But then with the sectors that you have decided to work with, that when you will agree, so you will have another reflection moment where you will look at more closely and together see where you have convergence of needs and that will allow you to agree on the target affected populations and area that you all want to target together. OK, so it doesn't mean each time it's food sake, health, wash, nutrition, prod, might depends. Some countries that make sense, maybe in some countries it just makes sense to work nutrition and wash, for instance. OK, and within the country it can be flexible from one area to, in, to the other. But what's important is really to sit together and agree Okay, where are we going to work together? What does it make sense? Then we will agree on a minimum package. What do this community need from both of us, or the three of us, or the four of us? And then we will decide, okay, how are we going to do it? How are we going to deliver those services? And then, of course, like any, any intervention, basically, we'll need to define joint indicators and how we are going to monitor. OK, and what's important within the HRP is really like bringing partners on board and to make sure that you will get like joint proposal with the, for the population in needs, meaning like a proposal where could be in consortium from different partners, can be only one partner if like I'm thinking of Action Against Hunger, for instance, where they have like zero different expertise that can answer to 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 um, a project sheet, for instance, but can be consortium, etc. So that's very important to think through that. And I would advise you to think of all that before HNO HRP, because it's quite a process, as you can see, that requires some consultations. And then make sure that at the end of the day, you get like joint project sheets that you will be able to to submit to to the donors. And I think I will stop here, Bryony, on this, except there is, yeah. So there is, like Bryony shared with you on the specific HRP steps, we also do have e-learning modules, so same place, Agora platform, where we do have like uh, e-learnings on the different cross-cutting themes that we just mentioned. So we invite you to, to go through. Again, if you struggle to access, just let us know. And we should have more on ISC coming toward the end of the year. And I think that's it. Thank you. Rainy, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so this brings us to the near end of our webinar. So we just want to dis discuss the available support to you from the GNC. Um, so of course, similar to um, other years, we are available for bilateral calls. So um, if you would like to reach out and schedule a call, um, we are most happy to support you throughout the HRP process. Um, we also um, would like to remind everyone that we are here to review your um, HNO and HRP documents as well. Um, if possible, we would actually like to provide input toward, towards all HNO and HRP documents. Um, so that would be done by our almost our full GNC operational support team um, and the various help desks within it, but also our cross-cutting focal points as well. Um, so specifically on the HNO support, we have antennae 
uh, NIS help desk um, and at our h and focal point. Uh, we've just heard from Rachel Lozano. So Rachel is our intersectoral uh, help desk um, and she can support with both the h and and HRP process. Uh, for the coordination, um, as the coordination help desk, that is myself, so Bryony Stevens, um, and I'm supporting the uh, English speaking countries specifically. Then we have Geraldine, um, who works on Monday and Tuesdays, supporting the French and the Spanish speaking countries. Um, for those of you on the call, if you if there are any French speakers, um, just a flag that we do have a French webinar taking place tomorrow um, on the HRP process, and you're most welcome to attend that webinar um, if you feel as though you need some additional support. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that uh, we are here to support you. We have other help desks as well that can support other functions. Um, and um, just a reminder that um, we warmly welcome all um, h &O and HRP documents to be shared with us so that we can review and potentially provide input. So I think that is it at our end. Um, so it is now one o'clock. Um, I'll just like to open the floor for any questions or comments. Um, so the floor is now open if anyone would like to share any comments or questions. Um, I haven't checked the chat, but I'll just check the chat now as well, just to see if there's been any questions uh, shared there. No. I don't think that is a good sign. It means that the guidance has been... Can I, just yeah. can I, can I oh, just Mabasa. come in with a question? Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 both of you. Uh, Rachel and Bryony for uh, 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 leading on this and uh, the presentation. Uh, and I just hope you're going to share this with us again. I think as it's uh, the tradition uh, to share the presentations, that will be very helpful, just in case you might have missed uh, one or two things. Uh, but mine is more or less like uh, a comment. Uh, I, I think we'll, I would reach out more uh, for, for support in, 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 in circumstances where uh, at, at, at the country level, you have uh, quite a lot of um, impediments in terms of uh, data collection uh, that is quite recent and representative. But I understand, I know, I think there are quite a lot of ways around it, uh, but all the same for our HNO HRP process to be as, um, as, 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 as uh, of a good quality as possible. I think we'll try as much as possible to uh, reach out for further support, unless if you may want to just uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, advise, maybe for the benefit of other people who may be in a similar circumstances uh, regarding just a depth of um, a current and representative assessment information that you would like to use maybe for pin calculation and such other, and such other, I mean, HRP, HNO processes. Thank you. Thanks, Mabasa. So I, I recognize that we didn't really go into um, detail on um, the PIN calculations um, or assessment side in this uh, webinar. Um, I'm not sure if you had the opportunity to join the recent h &O webinar. So I think that was conducted about two or three weeks ago. If you are unable yes, to join that. Yeah. Fantastic. OK, that's great. So I think that um, some of your queries I um, should have been responded um, or addressed in that webinar, um, but if not, we have Antenna on board. So Antenna can specifically work with you, Mabasa, on addressing your queries. Um, I would like to also highlight that we have specific modules, um, e-learning modules on GNC Learn as well um, that address your questions as well. I highly recommend the e-learning modules because you can go through them in your own time. Um, and as you go through the e-learning modules, you can actually apply what you learn directly um, for your h and HRP process as well. So I hope that helps Mabasa. If not, um, we have antenna 
and Antenna can specifically work on your requests. Thanks, Malasa. Um, sorry, see that we have a hand raised. Ah, well, one day. Um, one day, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and good afternoon, Bernie and uh, Rachel. My question is uh, the first one is uh, on the costing methodology. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you could like uh, present the pros and cons uh, associated with uh, with the post costing because uh, we embarked on it uh, in the 2022 and uh, we had some challenge. So maybe if we hear from uh, the global nutrition cluster perspective, uh, which one is, uh, I mean, uh, more feasible to actually it's, it's uh, it differs from country to country, but uh, we would like to hear from your uh, your thoughts, like the pros and cons of uh, uh, each the unit costing and the project based uh, costing. That's one. The second one, Ines already put it in the chat box. Uh, maybe if there if there are some recommendations on the HRP, for instance, what percentage of uh, some children should we target or mom children, mom PLW or micronutrients should be targeted? Again, this depends on the capacity of the clusters and uh, context matters. But as uh, indicated in sphere standard, there are like minimum uh, recommendation in camp setup in urban or rural uh, setting. So also here, if we have uh, some baseline or uh, or um, at least minimum uh, standards, it's just to hear from you that. Thank you and over. Thank you, one day. Um, so. Thanks for the two questions, um, both on the, the targeting as well as the, the costing methodology. Regarding the, the costing methodology, uh, great question. Um, I have actually been sitting on the costing um, uh, focal point advisory group with OCHA for the last two years um, and have been um, supporting closely the recent consultancy that took place. Um, and as you might be aware, one day, um, the, the consultancy that took place uh, was specifically on your question regarding the unit-based and project-based um, methodology. Um, so what was interesting, and also the mixed as well, what was interesting um, in terms of the outcome, so we have actually received the, the recommendations. So the final report on the recommendations has now been completed by the consultant. Um, and it's now sitting at an IASC level as it requires um, clearance um, before being shared um, with the prospective clusters. And once we do get the cleared version of the recommendations, we will, of course, share it with everyone, as well as sharing it on the GNC website as well. In answer to your question, um, and this was something that I was very much looking forward to. And when the recommendations, the um, the, the final version, which has which is still embargoed, um, I immediately opened up to see what the, the outcome of the evaluation was. But interestingly, the outcome of the consultancy um, indicates that um, both methodologies are equally valid. And as you said, one day depends on the country context. So I was personally hoping that we would go one way or the other, so then we could have a standardization um, uh, for this methodology globally and standardized guidance, which can be used um, universally. But the outcome of the evaluation is that both methods are considered to be, um, I guess, useful, and it really does depend on the country context. So with this in mind, um, it really does um, depend on the country, and I think the overall decision will come from OCHA in terms of what methodology to use at a country level. And once these recommendations are cleared, uh, we will, of course, share it with you. And the second phase of the consultancy is going to start working on guidance. Um, one of, as that's one of the recommendations, there's about 12 recommendations in total. Um, in terms of the guidance, because it was an outcome of the consultancy that both methodologies are useful, depending on the country context, we do expect that guidance will be, be developed on both. Um, so I know that doesn't really answer your question one day, but um, 
the good news is that we will soon have um, guidance on both methodologies for costing. So regarding the, the targeting, um, yes, um, we of course recommend the SPHERE standards. Um, and again, this really depends on the country context and the discussions which are taking place at a country level as well. We haven't really touched on targeting in this presentation. We do have an e-learning module specifically on this topic though. So I do recommend recommend going um, onto our GNC Learn um, and taking a look at that module. And again, if you have any specific questions on this topic, you can reach out to Antenna, who is our help desk um, at, on this topic and can provide you with bilateral support. I hope that answers your second question. One day. Um, I see that we also have a question from Innes um, in the chat box, and I think it'll, um, let me just open it up again. Um, okay, uh, regarding the um, aligning with the hack uh, from UNICEF, absolutely. Thank you for raising that. I may have forgotten to raise that in today's webinar. Um, I apologize, it was on my list of points that I did want to highlight, but we do try to um, ensure that there is alignment. Um, specifically with the UNICEF hack um, at a minimum. So yes, we do try to ensure um, alignment with other country level plans, um, both by UNICEF and other partners as well, um, as well as government plans um, and other documents that may be present, um, including preparedness plans, specifically in terms of the response, um, if applicable to the HP process. So in answer to your question, Innes, yes. Yes, thank you, Brian. Were there any other questions? If not, I'll just uh, ask on the GNC team if um, anyone would like to share any final comments or would like to compliment um, any of um, the responses that were just shared. And I do see that we also have a few of our cross-cutting um, themes, focal points from UNICEF on, on the call as well. I just want to first thank you for joining today's webinar and also thank you for your inputs towards the presentation. Um, just for our country level colleagues, we did get inputs from all of our cross-cutting themes uh, focal points at a global level um, and they have also contributed towards our GNC specific guidance. Um, so as mentioned earlier, we will send a follow-up email from this webinar which will include a link to the recording as well as the PowerPoint and also the um, guidance documents, some of the guidance documents that we have discussed during today's call, um, including the updated versions of these guidance documents. So we will include most of these documents and I just want to thank our cross-cutting themes focal points for sharing these documents with us ahead of this webinar today. And if anyone had any last questions or comments. If not, then um, I'm happy to share that we have finished 15 minutes ahead of time. Um, which is great because I think that we went a little bit over time last year, so this is a positive. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining today's webinar, and I just want to reiterate the support that is made available to you through the GNC. You are most welcome to reach out at any time for any phase of the HPC, uh, from the HNO to the HRP, um, and of course for the other outputs as well once we come to them. Um, and if there are no other comments or questions? Then I will close today's webinar and thank you everyone once again. I hope you have a great morning or afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.